Father God, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for the awesome worship service, Lord. The uh, song set was very apropos. Lord, help us to truly recognize who you are, to know your goodness and your mercy and your love. Thank you, Lord, that you reign and that you're sitting on the throne. You're a great God and a great king. Father, help us to partake tonight of your word. Give us ears to hear and a heart to receive, Lord. Bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Johnny, in his opening prayer, was talking about the attributes of God. We're going to hit a little bit on that tonight. Please open your Bibles to the book of Malachi, chapter 3, as we continue our journey through the word of God. The people in Malachi's day were really messed up in their thinking towards God. According to Malachi, the people were guilty of many serious sins. The priests were offering blemished animals in a formal but insincere religious ritual. Many were divorcing their wives to marry pagan women. Most had been disobedient and disobeying God's law by withholding tithes of their harvest. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And they were all accusing God of loving them only half-heartedly and of being unjust in his dealings with them because he had not prospered them, get this, adequately. God didn't do enough for them. If they could have put their feelings into words other than these recorded by Malachi, they may have said something like this, quote, we have been utterly faithful in fulfilling our responsibility towards God. Never mind the divorces and the mixed marriages, never mind the ties. We keep our side of the bargain through many things that seem important to us. The problem is that God has not kept his side of the bargain. We've been faithful. He is unfaithful. In short, obedience to God does not work. God has not prospered us as we think we, he should. And the fault is God's alone, end quote. Now, we know the answer, of course, is that God had not changed. It is not the people, it is the people who had changed, falling away from the true love for him and from the truly righteous life their forefathers once had. But in another sense, the problem is that the people, and we must include ourselves at this point, had changed so little. Though fallen from their original and early devotion to God, they were nevertheless exactly as they had been for so much of their history. They were exceedingly sinful and self-righteous, and they needed to repent. And as we'll see with verse 6, the fault lies with the changing attitude of the people towards God, not the faithfulness of God. So with that, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, which says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you... From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how ha shall we return? So here God reminds the Israelites that they owed their very survival to his unchanging faithfulness. God keeps his promise to the patriarchs. He knows this evil generation will pass and that a God-fearing one will yet come to inherit the promise. But they thought that God was like themselves, that he would close his eyes to their sins and not judge them for breaking his laws. Psalm 50, 21 says, You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will reprove you, end quote. The sh Jews should have been grateful that God was unchanging in his nature, his purpose, 
and his promises. For if he were not, he would have consumed them for their sins. In theology, this doctrine is called immutability. It means that being perfect, God cannot and does not change. In order to change, a moral being must change in either one of two ways. Either he must change for the better or he must change for the worse. God cannot get better because that would mean that he was less than perfect earlier, in which case he would not be God. But God cannot get worse either because in that case, he would become imperfect, which he cannot be. God is and must remain perfect in all his attributes. Verse 6 is a classic statement of immutability. He says, I, the Lord, do not change. But we immediately ask, what are the specific areas in which God does not change? And why does God mention this particular doctrine here? Now, it would be a valid exposition of this text to list every one of God's attributes and show how God does not change in any of them. Attributes like sovereignty, and wisdom, holiness, self-existence, self-sufficiency, knowledge, and justice. But the relevant attributes here are his love, mercy, grace, and faithfulness. Verse 6 says that it is because of God's immutability in these areas that the people have not been destroyed. Now, at first glance, this is surprising because the theme of the preceding verses has been the people's complaint, where is the God of justice? In such a context, if God replies that he has not changed, he should expect him, we should expect him to mean, I have not changed in my demands for justice, and I will judge the ungodly. Instead, we find that the emphasis is on his grace and mercy. Even when we are looking at the previous verses, we saw that God was coming not to judge, but to save his people. The message was to prepare the way for Jesus, who would redeem and purify them. Remember what we read in chapter 3, verse 1, which said, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. We find that same thing here. God emphasizes his immutability to say that he is unchanging in his faithfulness, which is why the people have not been destroyed for their transgressions. How gracious of God. The people were accusing him of changing, of having some unfaith becoming unfaithful. God replied that he is unchanging precisely in his faithfulness, which is why the very people had not been cast off. Twice, Moses uses this truth about God as his argument when he interceded for the nation. You can see that Exodus chapter 33 and Numbers chapter 14. The same principle applies to believers for today. 1 John 1, 9 states that God is faithful and just to forgive our sins. God is faithful to his promises and just toward his son who died for our sins that we might be forgiven. Malachi has proved that God is just. Now he discusses the fact that the people are unjust in the way they've turned from God and robbed God of what rightly belongs to him. Again, verse 7 said, From the days of your, father, your fathers you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Right here, the whole history of Israel's covenant relationship with the Lord is brought under review. As one commentator put it, quote, If like people, like priests, apply to the spiritual leaders of the nation, then like fathers, like son, or like mothers, like daughters, apply to everybody else. From the days of the patriarchs until Malachi's time, the nation frequently disobeyed God's words, word, and God had to send prophets to call them to repent and return. God doesn't need to change. 
It's people who need to change. Whenever a problem crops up in your life, you can make two reasonable assumptions. First, the problem is never God. Rule that one out immediately. And second, the problem is usually you or me. That possibility deserves strong and immediate scrutiny. Usually the key that unlocks the answer to my problems is me. If I'm willing to change, God will change me. He says, return to me and I will return to you, end quote. This was a simple call to repentance. For those who have once walked with God and been committed to his covenant, they must return to him. When they do, they will find that he will return to them with blessings and the marks of his presence. In its most basic sense, repentance is turning away from sin and turning to God, right? We all know that. But then they go on to say, in what way shall we return? Now you talk about a blind spot. Jews in Malachi's day didn't know how to return to God. Or I should say, either they chose not to know, or they were simply ignorant. Blanchard points out something very interesting. He says, quote, some 400 years earlier, Joel wrote, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. You see that in Joel chapter 2, verse 13. 300 years earlier, Hosea wrote, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, who promised I will love them freely. You can see that in Hosea chapter 14, verses 1 and 4. A hundred years earlier, God's message through Zechariah was, return to me and I will return to you. We see that in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3. Even today, God is calling us to draw near to him and he will draw near to us. One commentator wrote, yet apparently unwilling to admit the sins on their part needing repentance, the invitation to return is met with another cynical question, asking, asking how they can return when from their perspective, they haven't left. God has. The truth was God hasn't changed and neither have they. He was as righteous as ever and they were as unrighteous as ever, end quote. God had not changed, nor had his promises, but these people were so errantly satisfied simply to go through the religious rituals that they'd ask, how shall we return? They thought all was well as far as they were concerned, that they were doing all the right things, moving in all the right direction. In the next section, he tells them how. Verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Here God bluntly states that he is, his very own people are robbing him. Thievery against people was bad enough, but only a fool would try to rob God. So the question is, how does one rob God? Some weeks ago, standing out on the porch out there, I was, uh, me and someone else were standing there talking about, they were writing out their check for the uh, tithe, and I said, I put my hand out like, you know, you can, you can give it to me, I'll take it, just put my name on it. And he was saying, well, this is for the Lord. And I just sort of jumped back and said, oh, no, no, okay. And we were talking about how the most despicable of thieves would not rob a church for fear that they were robbing God. Yet this was the charge against Israel. It was an expression of astonishment. Will a man rob God? Astonishing because it is such a daring thing to do. Astonishing because it is, it is shamefully ungrateful. Astonishing because it is senselessly self-destructive. Astonishing because it will certainly bring punishment. Listen to this, what Spurgeon wrote. Quote, 
The astonishment arises from the fact that the action is altogether unnatural. It is illogical and self-condemnatory. I don't even know if that's a word, but I think it may be a word in England. Self-condemning is what it means. If we had a God, if we have a God, how dare, dare we rob him? Look at the heathen. They must have a God. And since they know no better God, the heathen makes to themselves a God of wood, of stone, or of clay. When they have made these false gods, they pay them homage as if they were gods. For them, they build temples and altars and shrines. Nations in the olden times had no banks, but treasures deposited in the temples were safe from robbery. It was not supposed that a thief would break into a temple. To go to, to, to do so was a flagrant crime. There was an awe upon the minds of men which re rendered it an audacious felony to rob their deities, false though they were. Men who would have plundered palaces kept back from the temple of Jupiter or Minerva or Diana. No man would rob even an image which he thought to be of a god. If heathen would not rob their god, shall we dare to do so who have so much light as to the one living and true God? Will men profess and call themselves Christians venture upon a profanity from which the heathen retreated with a shudder? Can man be guilty of it? Will a man rob God, end quote. God called it robbery because they had unlawful possession of what belonged to God. It wasn't because only the tithes and offerings belonged to God. In fact, everything we have belongs to God. Psalm 24, 1 says this, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalm 50, verse 10 says, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all of its fullness. Now, yet God does not normally command us to give everything that belongs to him. He allows us to keep some as managers on his behalf. But the tithes and offerings are different. They are not given to us to manage. They belong to what the Lord calls my house, the house of the Lord. Turn to Leviticus chapter 27, please. Leviticus 27. Beginning in verse 30. It says, in all the tithes of the lamb, whether the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it, at, if he, even if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commands which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel, Mount Sinai. From this tenth, the Levites themselves paid a tenth to the ministering priests. This is what the people had done. They had undoubtedly made some small contribution to the Levites and temple service as part of their facade of religious service. But they had not gone the, given the whole tithe. They had certainly not presented even what they did give with a willing and thankful heart. They gave it grudgingly. They needed to change in this area. Verse 9 goes on to say, You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. 
and robbing God, the people were not fulfilling the covenant they had made with the Lord. Therefore, God couldn't fulfill his promise and bless them. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. We've been through this one many times as we've gone through the minor prophets, but let's just one more time. Here's what was promised to them. Beginning in verse 8. Chapter 28, verse 8. The Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns and in all that you put your hands to. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he swore to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. So all the people of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will be afraid of you. The Lord will make you abound in, pros abound in prosperity in the offspring of your body and in the offspring of your beasts and the produce of your ground and in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open for you his good storehouse, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. These were the blessings that they could look forward to. But because they did not give as they were supposed to give, they were cursed. The nature of the curse that we'll be talking about in verse 11, which had to do with famine due to pests like locusts, eating their vegetation, and vines without grapes. But stay in Deuteronomy and drop down to verse 38. It goes on to say, you shall bring out much seed to the field, but you will gather in little, for the locusts will consume it. You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm will devour them. You shall have olive trees throughout your territory, but you will not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives will drop off. Because you are robbing me shows how they were continuing to behave. And notice how me is strongly stressed to bring out the gravity of their offense. It was not just a matter of reducing the income of the priests and Levites. God had required that they be maintained in this way, and the action was against him. Where it says, the whole nation of you conveys the suggestion that they had become practically heathen. Their stingy attitude proved that their hearts were far from God because God is the great giver. Many people with financial problems fail to do the most important thing first, obey and honor God with their resources. When we put God and his kingdom first, he promises to meet our other needs. We know that the word tithe means tenth. It's first mentioned in Genesis 18 when Abraham gave offering to the priest Melchizedek. In the Mosaic law, there was not just one tithe, but four different tithes, three per year and one every third year. This meant that the annual tithe in the Old Testament for the Jews was not just 10%, but 33%. The first one-third of the people's income belonged not to them, but to God. So now the important question arises. Are New Testament believers under the Old Testament law concerning tithing? Well, here's my answer. We're free from the law, but not the principle. We're free from the laws of tithing to the same degree as we're free from the laws concerning diet or feast or sacrifice or Sabbath. God isn't concerned any longer with whether or not we do work on Saturday but isn't there wisdom in setting aside a day for rest and worship? Of course there is. The principle is still applies. The situation changed radically after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension because he was the mediator of a new covenant, also referred to as a better covenant. The old covenant sacrificial system had served its purpose and had been replaced by Jesus, who in his death, put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. We can see that in Hebrews chapter 9. 
As the Jerusalem temple was destroyed in AD 70, it is obviously no longer the designated place for corporate worship, and Christians no longer need a priest to act as intercessor because they, have, they form a royal priesthood. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of, his, of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, end quote. And the same is true with our tithing. Luke 6.38, Jesus said, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Jesus does not stipulate any amount or any interval, but the principle behind giving is still in force. Although tithing is not mentioned, the giving of weekly offerings in 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says, on the first day of every week, of, I'm sorry, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he, has, as he may purpose so that no collection be made when I come. And more importantly, it is generally the case that in the New Testament, the obligations of the Old Testament legislation are heightened rather than lessened. This is, the law is interpreted in the fullest measure. So while we are not required to give a specific tenth of our income, it is hard to think of a normal Christian blessed with the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ doing less. Under reasonable circumstances, circumstances, any true believer in Christ should give more than the tenth, for all we have is the Lord's. In other words, 10% should be the minimum that we give. When asked about tithing at the jail, I teach that you can't outgive God. I believe that the reason that many Christians have such a hard time giving is because we really do not trust God to take care of us. We think we must store up money for ourselves against the day when money may run out and God will not be able to provide. I'm sure all of us have heard stories or have our own testimonies how, how God has provided what it seems like all was lost. Cindy came home last night with this, all excited about this story. She walked in the bedroom and said, God is good, God is good, because she, she, she got this coat when she went out shopping and ended up paying $20, Cindy? $25 for a coat that was like 100 bucks. So we all have those stories. We know where God will provide when we give out of a right heart. As one commenter put it, put it like this, can God take care of us? Can God care for his people and at the same time use their willing generosity to provide for Christian work here and in other lands? Of course he can. To doubt him in this and give little, in some cases nothing, is to rob God and slander his sovereignty, end quote. Whenever we rob God, we always rob ourselves. To begin with, we rob ourselves of spiritual blessings that always accompany obedience and faithful giving. Now, let me say this about our church. We don't make a point of talking about giving and money unless it comes up in the scriptures and that's what it is. This is what this is about. 2 Corinthians, again, 9, 6 says this. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he's purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that, always have, so that always have an all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad. He gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seeds to the sower and bread, um, bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will, be you will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which 
through us is producing thanksgiving to God. But even more, the money that rightfully belongs to God that we keep for ourselves never stays with us. It ends up going to the auto mechanic or the doctor or the tax collector. You have shown much, you have sown much, but bring in little. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes, says Haggai 1.6. If we don't trust God to care for us, whatever we do trust in will prove futile. People who lovingly give tithes and offerings to God find that whatever is left over goes much further and brings much greater blessings. In fact, listen to this challenge by God in verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Now, I like the way the New King James says it, mostly because it's the way I learned it. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. This was the answer to their problem, to actually do what God commanded them to do and to bring all the tithes to God. It wasn't that they weren't giving anything to God. They simply didn't bring all the tithes to him. They must not fall short in giving God everything that he's asked for. Paying the priest was one reason God required a tithe. This also is how pastors are paid from the tithes. This is the portion of scripture that changed my life and set my feet on the path towards Christ. I told you guys when I did the introduction that I couldn't wait to get to Malachi. And this is why. This right here. About money? This is what changed your life? Well, it wasn't about the giving that made such an impact on me, though it did make uh, giving a lot easier for Cindy and I. It was the challenge, putting God to the test that got my mind reeling and wondering. I had never heard anything like that before. Test God and see? I was always taught that you don't test God. But here it was, right in front of me. In the Bible, God was saying it. One commentator wrote, we're often cautious not to presume upon God. Avoid projecting our expectations on him. We're to leave the outcome to his sovereignty, yet not here. When it comes to tithing, we're commanded to test him, to try him, to prove the faithfulness of his word, end quote. Now I need you to understand that I was a brand new Christian. I had just got my first Bible and was trying to read it. Everybody kept saying, just read your Bible. And it was frustrating as heck because no matter where I turned, I just didn't comprehend. I just couldn't understand what this book was talking about. And I've told many times the story of how I I took the Bible, just threw it across the room and said, forget it, I'm not reading this thing. So reading Malachi was just an act of convenience for me. It was a small book, and as I read it, it seemed to be, I I understood a little bit of it as I was reading it, but it was still confusing until I got to that verse. Test me, try me and see. Now, understand, I'm a new Christian. I don't know anything, okay? So when I saw that, I wasn't applying it to money. I was applying it to everything, to everything in the Christian life. Test me and see. Try me and see if everything I say in this book will not, is not true. Of course, it is true. But that's how I applied that scripture. I learned later. But that was it. That verse caused me to press in because I wanted to see I wanted to see if everything in this book, everything in the Bible was true, if God was actually going to do everything he said he was going to do 
So out of an act of convenience, or dare I say laziness, I picked the book of Malachi. Little did I know that God had a different plan by starting me in the book of Malachi. But getting back to our text, God says, put me to the test. As I said, this is not something that we do. In my opinion, it shows a lack of faith. Psalm 95 verse 8 says this, Do not harden your hearts as in Meribah, as in the day of Manasseh, uh, Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my works. Here the challenge before the people was to see if the Lord Almighty, who has all under his sway, will indeed reward obedience. The command to test God is as much a test for them for the required response involving a willingness to act in faith. The storehouse referred to the temple treasury. The priests were support, supported from these resources, and God wanted to make sure his, people, his priests were amply supplied. The tithe of Israel was also to be used to help the poor, and once every three years, some of it was put aside for that purpose. Still, the main purpose for the tithe was to support the tribes of Levi and the priests. Now, I'm going to stop right here for tonight, but we'll continue with verse 10 next time we're together. In light of what we're talking about tonight, I wanted to end on a very high note and tell a quick story that I believe is the perfect example of being able to, to out, not outgive God. Again, Luke 6.38 said, Give and it will be given to you, good in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And, and over will be put into your bosom, for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So question, do any of you know who Henry Crowell is? Anybody? No? Henry Crowell was a Christian philanthropist who founded the Quaker Oats Company. Born into a wealthy family and having inherited a large sum after his father's death at 36, Crowell worked hard and honestly, even though he probably could have lived very well from what he had inherited. He saw all that had happened, he saw all that he had as a stewardship from God and therefore sought to honor him with his wealth. Crowell overcame tuberculosis at a young age, the same disease that had killed his father. After traveling around the country to help fight the disease, his family eventually settled in Chicago. He brought Quaker Mills in 1881 and married his first wife, uh, Lily, a year later. Lily suddenly died just two and a half years into their marriage after giving birth to their first child, a daughter they named Annie. In 1888, he married Susan Coleman, and together they powerfully influenced uh, together, they uh, had a powerful influence on others for Christ. When Crowell was a boy, his family attended Second Presbyterian Church in Massachusetts. His father was concerned about how his great wealth would affect his child. So from a young age, he taught eternal values that would put earthly values in their, in their proper perspective. Crowell was only nine when his father died and the loss pressed him to come to terms with his own faith in God. So having spoken to his pastor, he trusted in Christ. After listening to D.L. Moody preach, Crowell prayed, I can't be a preacher, but I can be a good businessman. God, if you will let me make money, I will use it in your service. Throughout his life, Crowell had a passionate hunger for God and his word. He sought the Lord through the various family and business struggles that he endured. Together with his wife, Susan, they were known not just for their financial wealth, but also for their strong Christian beliefs. They shared the gospel with others in the context of their business and social circle. In fact, numerous corporate giants professed faith in Christ because of their shared influence. For 40 years, Crowell served as the chairman of the board at Moody Bible Institute, and he helped financially endow the school 
In fact, the college named their 12-story Crowell Hall after him. He and his wife supported over 100 like-minded evangelical organizations through the Henry, Parson, and Susan Crowell Trust. He also taught new methods of marketing, merchandising that are still used and used in business today. In fact, he introduced that, the idea that humans, not just horses, can eat oats, oatmeal. Many of his colleagues regarded his work highly as he proved himself an extraordinary businessman. Crowell died in 1943 at the age of 82, having given away roughly 70% of his income for over 40 years. He was one of the wealthiest and most influential Christian businessmen in Chicago at the time. The more money he gave away, the more he prospered. His life powerfully portrays one who trusts in God with all that he has and all that he is and all that he has. It is said that when he started Quaker Oats Company in 1901, that he pledged to God, I'll give you 90%, Lord, and I'll take the 10%. I heard this story multiple times on different radio shows and stuff like that. And I looked it up to see if it was in fact true. And in light of where we're talking about of not being out, of get out being not being able to outgive God, I just thought it was a very apropos story to talk about a man who had faith and trust in God through his business dealings, who didn't have to do it because he was wealthy. He had all the money that he needed or could ever want, and yet he kept shoveling it out, and God kept blessing him. Now again. This is not why we give. We know that. But it was just an example of not being able to outgive God. How dependent are you on God? How much do you trust him? As a young Christian, for me, this was very moving. Again, not about the money, just knowing that trusting God and he would make a way where there didn't seem to be any way. And for, that, for, for those few years, I needed that as a young Christian to keep moving and to keep seeing God's hand at work in our life. And it seemed like everything that we did, every place that we went, everyone who touched our lives, it was just a blessing. Cindy and I came to salvation without licenses because we had lost them during our years in drugs. And God restored that. We got our license back. We didn't have a car. Tara gave us our first car after we came out of drugs. It was an old Pinto. You guys don't even remember it. You guys were not even born yet. We called it Ethel May. The car burned oil like crazy. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the thing about Ethel May. That little Pinto never left us stranded on the side of the road. Never. We drove that thing for two and a half years, and she never broke down on the side. As long as we put oil in it, she ran. That was God. And she lasted right up until we could get a car, buy an actual car, or buy a car of our own. When we bought a car of our own, we bought our second chance credit because our credit was so screwed up from when we were on drugs. Again, we paid off the car, and I went back to the same loan company and said, we want to get another car. And they said, why? You don't need us because you know second chance, chance, second chance credit charges you double the interest rate. He said, you don't need us, Mr. Bembry. Go to any bank, they're gonna, you're, you're, you're good. You're good to go. This was God. This was why this scripture met because it kept looking like God was just, he had opened up the windows of heaven and poured out blessings so much that there were days where I, we, were, we were just still basking in the, the glory of the last miracle when he was blessing us again. Again, young Christians, we weren't looking at it from that perspective of, Lord, gimme, gimme, gimme. It was just happening. It was just happening. And this is why this portion of scripture meant so much to me, to see a God who is living up to his word, not about the money, but the whole Bible, even though I misinterpreted the scripture in that way, that he was talking about tithes and offerings, God was opening it up to us in everything possible. We just, 
And we were growing in our walks and our relationship with the Lord. That was the key. We were growing. We weren't just sitting back taking in. We were growing. And God was preparing us, preparing me for times such as this. That's my testimony. Let's all stand. I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And thank God for men who have taken up the responsibility in those years and still today to try to point me in the right direction and to teach me and to uh, help me to learn and to open my eyes and to see. And the great thing about this relationship with the Lord for all of us is that as long as he's doing that, we know that he's not done with us. And I always want to be in his will. How about you? Amen? Amen. Amen. Father God, thank you, Lord, that you are still teaching, still showing us, still pointing us in the right direction, still giving us bits and pieces of wisdom to help us to know you more, to grow, Lord, to see you for who you are. And we are grateful for that, Lord. And we want to continue to grow and to learn and to see you as the great king, the great I am, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We say thank you. Lord, I pray that you would see us home safely. Until we come together again, we ask your blessing in Jesus' name.